Hello, ABM or road header? Hey, Dan, what was that you're looking for? Oh, just after the ABM and road header. Hello, Sparkies. Hello, anyone underground? Friday, the 19th of November 2010, at approximately 3.45pm, a large methane explosion occurred at the Pike River Mine in New Zealand. As a consequence, 29 miners were tragically killed. Two other miners who were in the drift miraculously survived after being unconscious for almost an hour after the explosion. The explosion was captured on the mine's CCTV at the mine portal indicating that the pressure wave lasted for almost a full minute. Being grossly unprepared for a major incident at the mine, the mine was unable to be sealed in order to prevent further explosions. Over the next 10 days, a further three explosions occurred, ultimately resulting in a fire at the top of the ventilation shaft. A Royal Commission was established by the New Zealand Government to inquire into the cause of the disaster. The Royal Commission heard damning evidence and published its report in October 2012. Despite years of ongoing investigation and much deliberation, to this day the miners remain entombed in the Pike River Mine. The 10 metre thick Brunner coal seam lies below the Paparoa Mountain Range National Park on the South Island of New Zealand's west coast. Despite the hostile terrain, numerous financial, geological and ecological challenges, the Pike River Mining Company commenced operations in 2008. It was eventually concluded to be cheaper and easier to construct a 2.4 kilometre uphill drift into the mine rather than build a road through the rainforest to access the coal seam. This development ended up being two years behind schedule and 100% over budget. Ironically, it won an engineering award. As the mine had approached the coal seam, numerous frictional ignitions of methane occurred. This was an early indicator of the mine's inability to manage the risks from methane. The Royal Commission found evidence of ineffective use of modern risk assessment and hazard management plans, which contained controls that were not implemented and management plans that were copied from other operations and were mostly ignored. The Royal Commission also heard evidence of the disbandment of the New Zealand coal mining regulator in the 1990s. Weak coal mining legislation and a lack of enforcement of what powers were available to the mines inspectors. The mining inspectorate was grossly under-resourced. Considering the pending list of ongoing issues with the mine, especially related to gas and ventilation problems, an international hydro mining expert who had been hired to assist an established mine production felt that the only way that the mine could be successful was to start again with proven equipment and experienced people. Pike River had neither. He feared the mine could explode and he advised mine management and left the mine. No sooner had the mine started mining coal, it hit an unknown, undiscovered fault known as a graben. When I finished my honours degree, which was in the late 70s, one of our lecturers said, why don't you work on coal? So quite soon we had to define our research projects and Mine was going to be principally greymouth coal field, so we decided to include Pike River to get a, a proper understanding of the geology. This is how the Brunner coal measures are typically illustrated as a single thick continuous coal seam. And this is certainly how it appears in the escarpment, but in fact, once we put the first hole down, it was completely different and you do get this a lot with geology. The, the small amount of data at the start makes things look simple. As soon as you get more information, uh, you get another layer of complexity and that just kept happening at Pike River. 
the vertical displacement of the coal was between two fault planes approximately 200 metres wide. This gives you an example of the type of information I would have been expecting to see. Drill hole logs, detailed feasibility reports, detailed geological reports, lots and lots of big A1 plans with a lot of detail on them. And that's probably about one third maybe of the total amount of information you'd expect for a project like that. And this is a report that I saw in the data room at the time of conservation. Good information, but it definitely was far less than what I expected to see. And um, uh, definitely not enough to make any assessment of a mining proposal. When we drilled some of those first six holes, there was gas bubbling from the coal. You expose it to the air and it fizzes. And that's not unusual with deep coal seams on the west coast of the South Island. These coal drill holes here, they've all had gas tests done on them. One of these holes up here had the highest gas content of um, any mine in New Zealand, so that was extremely significant. It meant that the entire mine was extremely gassy. But what was more concerning was the mining feasibility study that Pike River presented to me. All the ventilation modelling was based on a far lower gas content. And that meant that there was a risk of explosive outburst of gas within the mine. Not only hampered with geological faults, but the mine's main ventilation shaft was constructed in unstable strata and the bottom half of the shaft collapsed before it could be supported. A high resistance smaller shaft known as the alley mac rays was constructed to bypass the fall and connect the top part of the shaft to the mine workings. This restricted the ventilation capacity of the mine. Due to accessibility, the main fan was also located inside the mine rather than on the surface a practice not applied anywhere in the entire world. And despite its small size, the mine still struggled with adequate ventilation. The gas make of the mine exceeded the ventilation capacity and excessive gas trips caused gas delays to production. The strata was difficult, there was more gas than expected, and there was less ventilation than required. The surface topography of the Peproa ranges over the Brunner Coal Seam was inaccessible, inhospitable and environmentally sensitive. Access for exploration and infrastructure was significantly limited. Consequently, it was difficult and expensive to gain vital technical knowledge about the strata and the gas in the proposed mining area. The main development of the mine workings had been carried out using a road header and Waratah continuous miners. The installation of roof bolts was the primary strata support method. Desperate for the production of coal, Pike River installed a trial production panel. The trial panel was only one pillar long and installed between the Graben and other planned development roadways. The trial production panel used hydro mining. It involved a high pressure water jet known as the monitor. The monitor cuts away at the coal which is then allowed to flow in a loose wet mix towards the guzzler. Both the monitor and the guzzler were situated in the main gate roadway close to the face. The tailgate roadway was driven into the upper level of the seam and the main gate was driven on the floor of the seam. This served as a gravitational path for the washed coal mix to run towards the main gate and into the guzzler. The guzzler collects and crushes any large coal lumps and then processes the water coal mix into the flume conveyancing system which in turn ferries the coal to the pit bottom crushing and pumping station. From the pumping station the coal mix is then pumped down the main drift out of the mine along a pipeline to the surface preparation plant approximately 8.2 kilometres away from the mine. Methane exceedances throughout the history of the mine's development had been a critical issue. Add to this the poor ventilation system and not only was the hydro panel emitting large volumes of methane but exploration boreholes were also draining gas. Some exploration boreholes had intersected the hydro panel in the Goth area. Those open boreholes were pouring methane directly into the Goth of the trial panel. The experts advising the Royal Commission concluded the most likely source of the methane for the explosion would have been the hydro panel Goth. The Goth area was estimated to be approximately 30 metres wide, 40 metres deep and 9 metres high with a volume of approximately 6,000 cubic metres after some initial Goth falls. 
the unventilated GOF would have accumulated methane following the mining process and the additional emissions from the exploration boreholes that intersected at the back of the GOF. Calculations following the first explosion estimate that the volume of methane that was required to result in the first explosion would have been approximately 2,000 cubic metres of methane. The Royal Commission concluded the most probable cause of the explosion was a considerable roof fall in the GOF, most likely displacing a large volume of methane into the mine workings where it was diluted to form an explosive mixture of gas. The actual source of ignition was not able to be determined but clearly there was a source of ignition. Now, no mining was occurring at the time of the explosion, which limits some of the potential sources of ignition. The Royal Commission investigated numerous sources of ignition, but found that the mine's fluming pumps were started only approximately eight seconds before the explosion. The coincidence with the timing of the explosion led the expert panel advising the Royal Commission that an electrical fault was the most likely source of ignition for the explosion, although this could not be absolutely proven. Due to the high risk of a subsequent explosion, mined rescue were prevented from entering the mine. The risks were simply too high. Five days later, a second explosion occurred. Following that, two further explosions, one with sufficient force to blow the surface fan enclosure completely off its mounting. A fire at the exposed shaft continued to burn until the mine was eventually sealed and pumped with inert gas. This task was completed by the Queensland Mines Rescue Jet Engine Mine Inertisation Unit. In addition to the potential risks of entering the mine, it was also discovered that a major roof fall had occurred at the end of the drift, blocking any attempt to access further into the mine. For those people who think that there's a window of opportunity to enter a mine after a mine explosion, there is no window. Every rescuer wants to rescue another miner, and that's why they do it. But to risk more lives from an already tragic event is a risk that just cannot be accepted. Some secondary explosions are within minutes, others days, and you never know until it happens. Following the Pike River mine disaster, there are no more underground coal mines in New Zealand. The mine is near a sealed memorial to those who tragically died at the Pike River mine. Probably the saddest story was, was Joseph Dunbar, who was only 17 and it was his first day. And he wasn't even supposed to be there. He was due to start on the Monday. But he came in on the Friday because he was keen. And he was with the drillers. And the drill foreman said, come out with me at lunchtime, I'll drop you home. And he said, no, I'll stay and go out with the guys at four o'clock. So Joseph Dunbar was a child. He had no knowledge of mining in any shape or form. It was his first hours in the place and he never came out. It was all a waste. 29 lives, $300 million. Very badly managed. There's a hard rain of falling A white dove is flying A mother is calling A lover is crying There's a silver mist on a mountain million tears in a fountain a father is calling son come home hold on to the time Time. 
Let us remember our brothers, our brothers, twenty-nine. 